Wonderful. Well, my name is Nicole Bernardi Reyes. I'm one of the producers of Radical Grace. Thank you so much for coming out tonight, and thank you so much for staying. Um, I'm going to let my esteemed panelists introduce themselves, and then we're going to have a little chat about uh, living the life of social justice. But Kathleen, you want to go ahead? Uh, my name is uh, Kathleen Desitel. I'm a sister of Providence, and I work at the Eighth Day Center for Justice along with my uh, compatriot out there, Mary Kay Flanagan. Well, good afternoon. My name is Halbert Williams. Uh, I'm a caseworker at St. Leonard's House, uh, where Sister Jean, she was employed, and she just brought such a colorful uh, personality to St. Leonard's House. And so it was just awesome for me to see her in so many different you know, aspects other than just at St. Leonard's House. So she has had a great impact on my life, and I'm glad, glad to be here. Had you seen the film before? I only saw some snippets. So, to, and I also witnessed um, when the cameras were on grounds and um, she came, you know, they has had little bits and pieces. I, I saw myself, I was like, wow. <laughs> and so it was just great. You know, Sister Jean was just a, a great human being. Yes, yes, she was. It's funny because um, I actually was there filming yes, with you. Yes. And uh, I spent so much time in the edit room that I, you know, sometimes you forget that the people, you haven't seen them in about a year, and then you go up to them and you're like, hey, what's going on? And they're like, I don't know who you are, lady. Um, <laughs> and I'm like, no, we're best friends. Um, so anyway, since the topic of today is living a call to act for justice, um, and you both knew Jean, I thought maybe we could just start off the conversation with, um, and you both, you know, your work is justice work. If we could maybe just talk a little bit about um, kind of what you might have learned from Jean in working with her about this. Well, uh, those of you who may not know, uh, Jean was uh, a staff member at the Eighth Day Center for uh, about 12 years. And so uh, there are a lot of, lot of um, lessons that I learned. Jean was, as you could see in the film, a uh, woman of humor. Uh, she was dogged. She was um, always one that could um, see the other side, but was clear about what her work was all about. And I think she had a real heart for uh, doing the direct service. And so I think her work at St. Leonard's, uh, wa they were one of the happiest years, I think, of her life. Yes, yes, they were. Uh, Sister Jean at St. Leonard's house, you couldn't put her in a box. Um, she, will, she will not stay in it. Um, you will often see uh, Sister Jean while at St. Leonard's house, we have a balcony and um, she, she would smoke and she would come out and um, she would look down on everyone else and um, she may see someone, she may just start a conversation. You know, she was always one to, uh, to have a one-on-one, -on -one, you know, conversation and get to know people because uh, people come in periodically. Uh, you know, it's a six-month program of a transitional housing program for those who have been formerly incarcerated returning back into society. So Sister Jean will often have people to come up, help assist her uh, with, with mailings and putting stamps on envelopes and, you know, always events that St. Leonard's Ministries would have. And so Sister Jean was just one that would always have that time to find out, you know, what's happening in an individual's life, um, what came about where they made a decision that ended them up in um, the Illinois Department of Corrections and then coming to St. Leonard's house and wanted to know what their goals were. So Sister Jean was always a champion. Um, I have one uh, one story about Sister Jean. There was an individual who came to St. Leonard's house, and he was um, one who was uh, pronounced dead. You know, if I'm just, uh, if that's the right word. Um, his social security number was inactive. It said um, someone who uh, passed at this. It was confusing, but his social security uh, number wasn't active. And th although he was still alive and someone had passed, you know, with the same social security number and they were around the same age, it was kind of confusing. Um, but Sister Jean, she would go with this individual to the Social Security Administration and uh, she'd be really in the fight. 
uh, with the individuals there, she was just so passionate and zealous and trying to uh, have an understanding, like, he's right here with us, you know, and <laughs> you're telling us he's dead. He's not dead. He's right here. And, you know, his, his name is, you know, if it was me, a, a, a white, you know, he was African-American, a white woman, you would do this, you would do that, and I'm right. And so she was just one, Um, she just broke all boundaries. She was just a real person. You know, you couldn't put her in a box, and you couldn't help but love Sister Jean when she comes around. She also helped in a high high school program. Sister Jean was just everywhere. Everyone loved her. I love her, and um, I didn't see her in those different aspects. And uh, at this, you know, the the Adrian house. You know, I only seen her at Saint Leonard's house, and oftentimes we will help her. And you know, everybody rushed to get the door for Sister Jean, and you know, Sister Jean took no mess off no one. So we love Sister Jean. She was just a realist. And, uh, yes, you just terribly miss Sister Jean and just seeing her uh, on the film. So I'm just grateful once again to be here. Oh, thank you. One thing, uh, while we were making the film, we actually talked to hundreds of sisters around the country to get their perspective on the censures, um, to understand their work better. And we came upon the three sisters that we did because we thought they were able to really be a you know, representative of the 60,000 women that kind of were involved in, in these centers. And um, for me, one thing that's always been really meaningful about the film and working on it is that I think they show different ways that you can work for justice. Yeah. And I think they um, actually are really give good patterns for um, somebody you know, this world we live in right now, there's so much going on and there's so much wrong and there's so much that needs to be fixed and it can feel overwhelming. But I think through each of them and what they're doing and who they are, they kind of give almost like a, um, you know, a path that anyone can kind of start thinking about what it means to work for justice and to, and to hear a call for justice. And so you both do very different types of work. Yes. Um, you know, would you describe what you do as justice work helpers? Well, first of all, I'm a caseworker at St. Leonard's House, so um, we're always looking for ways to uh, better assist uh, the residents and the population that comes to St. Leonard's Ministries. Um, we have to often uh, speak up for those who are not seen as fit for a second chance uh, at life and for reinventing themselves, and to be able to use uh, what we do at St. Leonard's House as selling points for for people um, to see them as human beings who have uh, made some, some poor decisions and to see the contributing factors that came along with them ending there. So um, at St. Leonard's Ministries, we, we're often met with more opposition, you know, than those who are for us, you know, to, you know, like just even the uh, surrounding community there on the west side. So it's just being able to stand up even against those who are set in their ways. And as I see in the, uh, the film is um, tradition, um, rules. And, um, you know, I hear some people say rules are meant to be broken. But, I mean, you know, in a sense, you know, um, not to allow them to restrict you from doing the greater good. You know, I'm thinking of a Sunday school lesson when it was talking about the Sabbath. You know, how it's still good to do, it's still right to do good on the Sabbath. You know, and we believe that we should always look for ways to be able to promote uh, the better good for human well-being. And so, and, and it helps us to be able to go, to go against the odds at St. Leonard's Ministries, to go above and beyond um, it, by us being a non-for-profit organization and just to continue to let people know about what we do, um, how the services that we have impact the life and reduces recidivism for those who come at St. Leonard's Ministry because we offer anger management, parenting, uh, those psychological services that are offered by the Adler School of Professional Psychology, substance abuse treatment. Um, they have counseling where we're able to get back into the, the early, earlier years to understand the learned behaviors and just the environments which individuals grew up in where it caused you to have empathy, where you'd be like, oh, wow, I'll never, you know, would have fathom, you know, individuals going through, they have to uh, live under certain circumstances. And so it's just um, being able to step outside the box. Well, one thing that um, I, I was fortunate enough, I got to spend the summer at St. Leonard's just talking with everybody and just, you know, just, just getting to learn the lay of the land and talk to the guys. And uh, Gregory Mallinger, who... Yeah, he was on my case. Oh, was he? 
I met Gregory the day he, he got to St. Leonard's, which w he had been in prison for 20 years. And I just was walking up to, you know, I just walked up to him and I sat down next to him and he almost hit me because <laughs> he was just like, what, <laughs> what's going on? What's going on? <laughs> and the, just that in itself, just, he couldn't believe that somebody, some white lady would just sit right. down and talk to him like a human being and wanted to hear his story. And I think that's something that is really just in anything anybody's doing is being this, this radical compassion of seeing somebody else as a human being first, not as their choices, can really transform people and can really sustain people. Exactly. Because um, it's often people that come through, want to do tours, uh, want to um, receive the stories. And that's what Adler does. They uh, exchange the Adler School of Professional Psychology. They exchange uh, their theory, you know, the knowledge that they receive for the personal experiences. And so it's quite um, encouraging and, and um, a self-esteem builder when people come around, want to sit, really get um, invested in what they're going through, what they've been through. And it makes them feel like, man, I'm accepted. You know, and that's at St. Leonard's House. And uh, we do a thing on birthday Wednesdays. A lot of individuals that come there, they're not even accustomed to having a birthday party. You know, people knowing their names, putting their names uh, in the dining area, cake, and we sing happy birthday. And this is done on the third Wednesday of every month. And um, Bob Doherty, a former executive director, he would always put together uh, with those who donate um, things for Christmas. And that's what's coming up now where people, they're not used to being together in a family environment, um, opening up gifts and just being able to share their stories and their struggles and to be able to vent. And that's one thing they offer at St. Leonard's House is that it removes the, the tension and, um, the, uh, um, and, and um, you know, just feeling like I can't be myself. Right. There are people that understand. And so it helps them to let their guards down. And so it's just, you know, when people leave St. Leonard's House, sometimes they don't, they don't know how to, how to function outside of St. Leonard's house because when they leave that, that structure of that love and sometimes they have to always come back. And so it's, it's one that builds self-confidence and uh, create a sense of self at St. Leonard's ministry. So it's a blessing to be there. And Kathleen, I saw you were kind of smiling and shaking your head when we were just, just talking right now. I was wondering if you had anything you wanted to add or if you wanted to speak a little bit about your work and kind of what motivates you. Well, um, we always say there are two feet of justice, and there's the one foot of direct service or charity, doing the good work that St. Leonard's does, and the other foot we, we name that social change, or trying to change the systems that are creating the problems in the first place. So Eighth Day's mission is that of trying to uh, address the systems, whether it's the economic system, the church system, um, the, uh, the systems that create the problems in which we then need to have good places like St. Leonard's that can work directly with those that are most affected by the policies that our government and, and at times our church uh, leaders put in. So Eighth Day's uh, work is to do education, to do advocacy, to do organizing, to do nonviolence, direct actions, uh, and the like. And so we've been around ourselves for 40 years. So, so whereas uh, Network here does a lot around uh, policy and reforming the system, uh, some of us feel like we need to transform the system. So I think we need both and. It's not one or the other. So uh, the, the aspect that Eighth Day uh, focuses on is to to work to change the system itself. So we've been uh, working with uh, Bob Doherty and and many of the women at Grace House, who um, every year we have a Good Friday Walk for Justice. So we invite the the uh, Grace House women always lead us in in that uh, effort, and it's a modern day way of the cross, if you will, in which various groups that are working on uh, social problems that we have, they design their prayer and we walk through the city to uh, raise up these issues. So it's, it's a, a both and. Great, thank you. Um, let's open it up to some questions. 
Does anybody in the audience have a question? Yes, ma'am, right here. Well, we know United Way helps uh, this Episcopal Church helps and donates, and we have funders from the state, Illinois Department of Corrections, HUD, uh, Department of Family Services. So they're quite a different, uh, you know, and, and also uh, funding has been scarce lately, and so that's something that um, St. Leonard's House is always, um, you know, appealing out to the, to those who are interested in this work and the building up of individuals. And so, yeah, I mean, funding, yeah, you know, we're a not-for-profit organization. Well, because I noticed in your county, the president of the county board is a woman. She's a personal, she's a personal friend of Jean's. Well, that's about changing the systems, though. Yeah, and, and, and then she is a champion for St. Leonard's Ministry. She's always there um, supporting. And so, you know, I, and I have no uh, details concerning, you know, as far as funding, but I know she's always trying to help, and she's always around. Anybody else? Um, the gentleman right here. particularly comfortable. Mm -hmm. uh, my question concerns the present status of women in the church. And now that Pope Francis has taken the sanctions off and freed you to do your work again, where do you see the church as a whole going in terms of accepting women as full participants? Well, uh, certainly Pope Francis is, um, it has a different style, does he not, uh, uh, from the former popes. Um, and I think his, um, his openness to dialogue and to question and to, as Simone said, I think he's uh, stirring up the pot, if you will, in, in Rome itself with the cardinals. But quite frankly, um, you know, I don't think they get women. I don't think they, they I, I don't think that we can expect uh, any large changes. Uh, Francis is a good man, and uh, certainly we're happy he's there. But on the other hand, in terms of his understanding or including women in for ordination, um, I, don't look f I don't look forward to that in my lifetime. Um, and I think what the film tells us is that we have to live our life and live what it is we know is right and just. And so I'd like to hope that in time, there are different strategies. And I think, you know, we have to go with as many strategies as we can to bring the word to, to uh, the men that run the show. But um, so, but, and in the meantime, we have to live and do the right thing that brings about a greater love of neighbor, uh, to give great mercy to all the people that need that, but to bring about justice, and that means that we have to change the systems. So as long as we have the system that we have, I don't expect women um, to be at least ordained in my lifetime. Now, I hope I'm wrong, and I hope I'm surprised, but uh, that's, you know, people ask me, do I want to be ordained? I really would not want to be ordained in this system. You know, it, the system needs train, uh, transforming. So, uh, but there are those who do want to be ordained. And uh, for them, I would, I would uh, certainly support them in that. But will we see the change in our lifetime, some of us here? Uh, I don't think so. I hope in mine. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so, too. Um, but I think, you know, uh, Sister Chris Schenk, who uh, 
led the pilgrimage to Rome. That's something she's been working on for the last 25 years, I think-ish. Um, start, but actually starting with restoring the diaconate, so actually regaining some of the places we already were um, before pushing forward. But you know, the church is the people of God, so if we don't rise up and, and continue to focus on this injustice and continue to push for that and to you know, demand equality for all of God's brothers and sisters and daughters and sons and you know, transgendered, cisgendered, all of us, um, then the system's going to remain the same. So I think one of the things that, uh, you know, I think the film is pretty successful and is, is showing the fact that when a community comes together to rally around something, great change can happen pretty quickly. And I just know God is no respecter of person. And um, oftentimes we look at the messenger that listen to the message you know, to see if it makes sense, you know, to see if it's moved by love. And that's one thing I was looking at, that sometimes we have to be willing to speak up for what we see that's an injustice and not just be silent because of the powers that be. And that's one thing I liked about the women. So I was encouraged. Good. Any other questions? Ma'am, right there. Yes. Thank you. Um, which sc which school, Adrian School, did you go to? Was it? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I have to get you affiliated with the Sisters of Providence. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so the background of the film is uh, the director, um, Rebecca Parrish, actually was really good friends with Erica Minor. Is that Erica's last name? Um, and Erica is, I think she's an atheist. I think maybe, or agnostic. She, sure. She's not, let's put it this way, she is not a easily defined person of faith. Let's put it that way so that I'm not casting any aspersions. I'm <laughs> been but um, she was really good friends with Jean. And so Rebecca, who grew up with an evangelical background, um, you know, she was baptized by her neighbors as an evangelical. She is married to a Hindu woman. She's not really, she's kind of a spiritual seeker, was really trying to figure out how, uh, you know, a queer, non very um, defined person of faith like Erica could be really good friends with a nun because she thought like, ooh, sister act, you know, um, as a lot of people do. So she started out by, exp you know, just kind of taking a look at what, um, how social justice could be a means of spiritual practice and started following Jean around and then starting to meet people like Kathleen and all these other sisters and really just became fascinated by the work. And then when the censures happened, she suddenly found herself with a bigger story. Um, at that point in time, she, uh, I met Rebecca. I actually went to Regina Dominican High School. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, yeah, there's a lot of suburban girls there. I don't know if I'd put myself in that category. <laughs> but um, I had 12 years of Catholic school. As you can see, it's influenced a lot of things about me, like the way I dress. Um, I, I wear this kind of thing all the time, the plaid skirts and just the black and white. Uh, but it also, you know, did develop a very strong um, sense of justice and speaking the truth and speaking words. And I, since I had been raised by nuns, basically, um, I was a good person to kind of come in and give that Catholic perspective. So we ended up where we did. We actually 
thought we were done shooting, and then Rebecca called me at like five o'clock in the morning one day and was like, the Pope resigned. <laughs> we were like, oh no, <laughs> what does this mean? Uh, so I think it actually turned out to be a much better film because of that, uh, because it wasn't just this. We never intended to make a film that was like the bad guys against these poor women. It was really about this is a community of faith, and how do you, what do you do to honor your faith and be true to your conscience? Right. Yeah. So um, what we're doing with the film now is we are in film festivals around the world. Uh, we've been seen in Croatia. We were at a women's festival in South Korea. Uh, we've been to uh, Mexico City. Well, we haven't been there, but the film's been there. And all across the country. Uh, we do have some educational distribution. So if you are a professor and you'd like your college to buy it, you can, you can do that. And we are working on a broadcast deal. We're also doing a very extensive engagement campaign, which means that people can, if you're interested in the film, you can have community screenings on your own. Um, we're working with people, um, like the wonderful people we have here, uh, also working with feminist organization, um, as well as interfaith organizations to kind of focus on faith and feminism. We are also kind of um, trying to make a goal of taking faith back for the progressive cause. It seems that in our country, conservatives have taken this mantle of faith as their own. And what I think, if we look at history, what we know is that some of the greatest strides as a nation that have been made have been made when progressive people of faith have joined um, secular people to push for change. So that's one of the things we're going to be doing. And if you want to keep up to date with us, since things are constantly changing, um, we have a great mailing list. And if you have your phones, usually I have a sign. I, I'm, a little, I'm a little off my game today. I don't have my props. But if you take out your cell phones, uh, it's a very easy way to sign up for a mailing list. You can, um, and I'll wait a moment since I see some people are taking out their phones. This is the one time you can actually take out your phones in the theater. <laughs> so what you are going to do is, the number is 33733. And then when you've put that number in, which is 33733, you're just going to text the word rad film, all one word. So R-A-D-F-I-L-M. Text it to that number, and then you'll get a link for our mailing list, and you can sign up there. And uh, we don't bug people too much, but we do have all of the latest screenings that we're doing, um, conferences. For example, Rebecca's actually at the Call to Action conference in Milwaukee right now. She'll be here later tonight for, uh, for the other one. So that's a good way to keep up for it. Oh, the subtitle, yes. So what's interesting is that um, we are, you know, we have interest from China. We have interest from a couple other places. One of the things that we are doing is we're asking for subtitles from the um, international film festivals that we are working with. Uh, so we are slowly getting those, and um, we're going to look at, you know, obviously once there is a demand for this sort of thing, we will we will then go ahead and subtitle it and, and do that. And hopefully we can get some international distribution. The trick with that is it's a strictly like a business thing for film is that um, it's a very American story. So there's not, even though there's, I don't know, how many Catholics are, how many Catholics are there? There's, you know. I don't know. Lots, lots and lots of Catholics all around the world. Um, you know, film distributors are kind of looking at other uh, other sort of things too. So we're actually looking at doing some things like perhaps just doing community screenings at a localized level, as well as just trying to, um, on our own, go and get distribution. Yeah, so. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Well, you, well, in a sense, yes. Um, 
we all we have a, a, a after care program that goes on for alumni, people who have successfully completed the program at St. Leonard's House, and um, they come back and um, they may speak. Oftentimes, it's around the Christmas time. We have a a, a Christmas dinner for alumni, and they'll come back and they'll speak to the present residents there at St. Leonard's House, tell them uh, what things were successful for them when they went through the program, and just to give them hope, you know, you know, as to what they're doing today. Some have come back with their own businesses. Uh, one I know, uh, Cedric Johnson, he has his own uh, demolition business uh, and moving, you know, and construction. So they come back and they also speak to the building maintenance courses that we have there in the Michael Barlow Center. So some do come back and they speak and, and they help and give opportunities for employment. And so they always come back and um, they always are uh, able to be an inspiration to others. Thank you. Yes. That's true. We have um, St. Andrew's Court for the men, our second stage housing facility. And then we have Harvest Commons, and that's uh, for men and women permanent housing, along with uh, Gracie's Cafe, which is on the first floor. We have our own uh, for our culinary arts uh, participants at the Michael Barlow Center who graduate and do well. They're able to get uh, on hands training there. And also we've been uh, also asking people to come out to Gracie's Cafe uh, for coffee and snacks and deli, deli goods. So, yes, we do have second stage housing for the residents to help them in a supportive living environment. Right. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, you know, w at screenings, there are people who come and they're very, um, very supportive and we have had some you know we've had some obviously we have sisters and we we have had some priests if at an official level uh no <laughs> so um uh, but i don't know if uh, i i feel like they probably know about us by now but uh but we haven't heard from them yes Yes, so, yes, uh, we are absolutely, we're talking to different different faith groups, we're talking to secular feminist groups, we are um, doing things like this where we're having, theat you know, where we're hoping to have some theatrical runs and, and we are definitely casting our net wide. So, thank you. Anyone else? No, well, thank you all so very much for coming. Um, we have a merchandise table out. If you like Radical Grace and you want to show your support, we have some really great T-shirts and stickers that say things like I heart human or women's rights. And uh, so go check it out and tell your friends. Thank you so much.